welcome to the special lecture session organized by Tiltma Foundation. I'm Dr. Bwai Lawad. The distinguished speakers will be our uh, ambassadors, Mr. Sujan R. Chinoy. The title of his lecture is Indo-Pacific and the Quad Opportunities and Challenges. Let me introduce to you Ambassador Sujan R. Chinoy is the Director General of Manohar Parikar Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis. New Delhi, a career diplomat, 1981 to 2018. He was Indian ambassador to Japan, to Mexico, Mexico, High Commission of India to Belize and the Republic of Marshall Islands. He's also been a, a specialist for the last two decades on, in China. He had an Indian expert group, diplomatic and military officials dealing with boundaries, disputes and confident building measures. During his foreign service career, he was also a deputy chief of mission to, in Saudi Arabia and Consul General in Shanghai and Sydney. Besides serving in Hong Kong and Beijing, he was the Indian representative also of the first committee, if I'm not mistaken. During his, uh, yeah, he was beside, he was the first committee at the UN at 1990, 1992 for the Quad country. In his deputation to Indian National Security Council Secretariat, he angered policy issues and strategic dialogue with the uh, counterpart organization around the world. He was also the rich experience in dealing with security challenges in India, extended neighborhood, terrorism and extremism, maritime security, defense reforms and modernization, infrastructure and connectivity. Ambassador Chinoy contributed extensively to newspaper and journals besides lecturing in India and overseas. He, was, he will take your questions from the audience after the lectures. Without further delay, let's now request our Excellency Ambassador Sujan Rarchinoy to deliver his lecture. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wail Awad uh, and uh, also Mr. Soham Das of the Tilotama Foundation. Uh, it's a great privilege for me to be you, with you this afternoon uh, to deliver a talk on uh, the Indo-Pacific and the Quad opportunities and challenges. Um, it may be useful uh, to begin my remarks with the very definition of the term Indo-Pacific. Uh, what is it after all? Is it geographic? Is it military? Is it a trading arrangement? There is so much that's being bandied about today, uh, both with regard to the definition of the Indo-Pacific and uh, more particularly uh, the subset known as, as these often ask. The Russians have also asked that question. Um, of, of, of course, uh, China suspects both the Indo-Pacific and its derivative, the quadrilateral security dialogue, to be a US-inspired clique uh, that promotes a Cold War mentality aimed at the containment of China's rise. Uh, historically, let me put it this way, that the Indo-Pacific existed long before the geostrategic competition of the 20th century began uh, between the US, uh, that is the reigning hegemon, and China, that is the rising hegemon. Uh, it is this contestation that has brought sharper focus on the concept of the Indo-Pacific, but it's not a new concept. In the past, uh, colonial powers such as the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Dutch, and the British were all motivated to acquire extraterritorial privileges and to consolidate their presence across uh, both these oceans, the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean, using the concepts of mare librum and mare clausum. These were strategies, mare librum meaning uh, open seas and mare clausum meaning closed seas. These were strategies employed by the colonial powers in the maritime space in the centuries that defined the colonial age. And the oceans themselves have always been conjoined. The waters that lap the shores of countries in the Pacific are the same waters that lap the shores of countries in the Indian Ocean. In fact, uh, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean are a very natural, seamless fit. Uh, you know, and uh, the, the later term, Asia-Pacific, itself is an artificial construct because it attempts to link uh, and it did so quite successfully for some time, linking an ocean to a continent. But about that, I will explain a little more in a moment. Let me get back to the colonial powers, because I began by saying that the Indo-Pacific is not a new concept. 
uh, the colonial powers engaged in geostrategic contestation essentially to divide the great maritime space into exclusive spheres of influence uh, it wasn't just influence that they were looking at for uh, trade was often followed by the flag uh, and then what came about was extraterritorial concessions and colonization the portuguese for example carved out the south atlantic and the indian ocean for themselves the spanish on their part created their own hemisphere so to speak dominating the pacific ocean in their own zones they acted as the dominant constabulary and worked on the principle of mare clausum to all others as in closed sea to all others or insisted on laissez passer um let let's pass a uh, extracting concession from uh, others now if i were to relate this to the contemporary frame of reference the friction is between the concept of free and open maritime space advocated by the dominant naval power today that is and still remains the united states of america and the neo colonial expansion that china seeks in both the oceanic spaces china seeks firstly uh, first and foremost an end to us domination on its periphery uh, it seeks an end to us elent imminent tekent operations uh, uh, in its uh, uh, so called contiguous seas just off the 12 nautical mile limit and it uh, really seeks to prohibit the us the right to so called innocent passage by military vessels in its territorial waters as well Uh, so china basically seeks uh, to evict the united states and uh, it also increasingly treats the disputed waters of the south and east china seas as mare clausum to be dominated by china both powers seek exceptionalism there is no doubt about that so the us which is the dominant power uh, continues to seek the traditional constabulary role uh, which it has played for many many decades in both the oceans and it has played this role since britain passed on the baton on the high seas uh, as it were uh, to the united states at the end of the second world war china on its part seeks a bailiwick for itself in its near oceans through what i might call arbitrary imposition of uh, uh, air defense identification zone uh, unilateral legislation uh, claiming islands uh, as part of uh, sovereign territory illegal conversion of uh, low tide rocks and sandbars into uh, militarized uh, islands and so on and so forth but the difference is that the order in which the united states has been so central and continues to be so central has proved rather successful in maintaining peace and stability for 75 years since the end of the second world war the order that china proposes Uh, something akin to a community for a shared future uh, asia for asians it really seeks uh, a foundation for a china centric asian order which is widely challenged by regional powers as well as other great powers so uh, uh, let me put it in a, a, a broader uh, context uh, in terms of the contradictions the contemporary contradictions do not end there the us proposes a free and open indo pacific without having acceded to the unclos treaty of 1982 although it actually helped shape the convention from the very beginning it is and remains a torch bearer for freedoms of navigation innocent passage and much else but rejects uh, certain parts of unclos uh, which relate to uh, areas beyond natural jurisdiction Uh, national jurisdiction pardon me um in a sense the us is like the modern day uh, hugo grotius uh, that famous dutch lawyer who was commissioned by the dutch east india company uh, in the 17th century to write a legal brief justifying why holland rejected the portuguese definition of a mare clausum in the strait of malacca grotius had claimed uh, and this is quite valid now as then that the seas like the air we breathe uh, could not be appropriated that the seas uh, were international territory that all nations were free to use as for china it disregards unclos 
and the ruling of the permanent court of arbitration which went in favor of the philippines despite having both signed and ratified unclos the us on its part conducts uh, uh, fonops against friends and foes without distinction among the dozens of countries in this category are india indonesia and the philippines all of whom by the way are otherwise part of the broader consultations among what you might call like minded countries friendly countries in the indo pacific last month india was also reminded by the united states that it could and would carry out fonops the freedom of navigation operations in the waters of the lakshadweep uh, that was conducted by the uss uh, john paul jones um the fundamental issue today is the rise of china as its economic power aggregates over the decades into more uh, you know solid military muscle it is spilling over into the broader region in terms of its trade interests its investments its uh, sea lanes of communication its energy uh, you know lanes of communication uh, and also uh, its ability to position uh, military power uh in certain bases uh, whether in djibouti or elsewhere to protect what it might regard as its interests the management of china's rise even more than any alleged containment is a huge challenge for everyone now this can only be done in two ways on the basis of an existing uh, uh, so called international rules based order as the us and others in the quad uh, are hinting uh, at in their vision documents and outcome statements or on the basis of a fresh one china bristles uh, and rejects any suggestions of an existing rules based order on grounds that it was never a party to such rules uh, and such an order which had been constructed by western powers at the height of their military power especially when china was weak therefore china is both a status quo power as well as an anti status quo power depending on the issues and interests at stake for example china seeks to forge a new international order that gives china greater salience commensurate with its new economic and military power it rejects aspects that limit its unilateral redefinition of its interests or its so called core issues or zones of influence uh, china's island building spree and militarization in the south china sea uh, is a good example of this at the same time it also wishes to preserve elements of the old order the existing order uh, which suit it especially those which facilitated its accretion of political and economic power such as for example its uh, status as a permanent member of the un security council uh, or as a member of the wto uh, since 2001 which in effect uh, gave rise to its uh, stupendous uh, economic uh, uh, development now today china's silk road economic belt and the 21st century maritime silk road together known as the belt and road initiative encompass the indo pacific space both maritime and continental and of course uh, it also goes beyond uh, the indo pacific uh, maritime space towards europe and latin america as well uh, not just the maritime space but also the terrestrial space continentally too including in eurasia historically china was primarily a landward oriented power except for the brief interlude during the ming period which was marked by the voyages of um, eunuch admiral chang he in the opening decades of the 15th century but before the ming the yuan dynasty that is the mongols who were foreigners um, they had invaded china they ruled over china for several centuries uh, they failed in their attempts to use china to launch maritime expeditions to engulf uh, japan within their domain but uh, the, after the ming had literally left their fleets to rot out of fear of inviting uh, what you might call detrimental or or ruinous global trade upon themselves the qing which succeeded the ming focused its energies on landward expansion towards the frontiers of mongolia xinjiang and tibet for the next 200 years just as the europeans were hitting their stride and exploiting an industrial revolution backed by endless supply chains extending to their colonies the qing dynasty's limited experience with naval power soon resulted in a major land sea defeat 
at the hands of the Japanese in 1895, resulting in the Treaty of Shimonoseki and the loss of Taiwan, Penghu, and the uh, Liaotung Peninsula. It also resulted in a loss of influence uh, in the Korean Peninsula that some might say continues till today, uh, that is for China. Uh, coming back to the term Indo-Pacific, which is gaining currency, uh, I should add here that it is emblematic uh, of the natural spread of uh, economic growth. It is representative of the contemporary prosperity, uh, which has spread over a wider region today, well beyond East and Southeast Asia, uh, to include South Asia and the dynamic East Coast of Africa. Yes, it's true that in the early years, uh, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, it was largely East Asia, thereafter Southeast Asia, uh, that gained from uh, the shift of traditional engines of economic growth uh, towards the Asian landmass. But today, this growth and prosperity has spread to a, a deservedly so, to a much broader region. And therefore, uh, I would say the term Asia Pacific, uh, which I regard as an offshoot of the geopolitical realities at the end of the Second World War, has effectively completed its shelf life. After the war, uh, the Great War, the Second World War, it was access to the great market of the United States across the Pacific that led to the rejuvenation of the Japanese economy to start with. And similar access later facilitated the economic rise of the Republic of Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan and Singapore. Uh, from the end of the 1970s, China too predicated its own economic rise on access to this one big, large U.S. market, uh, you know, that can make or break the fortunes of uh, an economy. This process of economic integration across the Pacific, in my view, was consolidated, uh, as I said before, as growth engine shifted towards Asia. But the term Asia in Asia Pacific literally meant a limited area, that is East or Southeast Asia. It was never an inclusive term. It reflected neither the aspirations nor the economic resurgence uh, in other parts of Asia, such as South Asia, and more relevantly now, all the way up to the dynamic east coast of Africa. The Indo-Pacific, by contrast, is a more contemporary and inclusive term, more accommodating of the growing aspirations of a wider constituency. It captures the interdependence of not just the oceanic space and not just all that lies in between, but also the interconnectedness of trade technology, and even the security challenges such as terrorism, which cruise throughout the region without any kind of, uh, you know, joint or, 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 or seam. A fundamental fact of the last two decades is that an ambitious China has been virtually seeking the expulsion of the United States and other major powers from its periphery. I did uh, speak about this at the beginning of my talk, but this is a point that I need to emphasize. The U.S. regards the U.S. presence in the region as an impediment to its own coming in to power, coming of age, its uh, kind of domination of Asia. Now, this is ironic in a way because the U.S. and other powers such as France and Britain have historically been part of the region with territorial possessions, nationals and trade and security arrangements. Uh, moreover, the U.S. has been a key factor in the region's uh, economic prosperity and stability after the end of uh, World War II, uh, balancing the adverse effects uh, uh, of the total absence of any organically evolved security architecture. The U.S. pivot to Asia, which uh, President Obama spoke of in his second term, it was long in the making, uh, but short on delivery. It was diverted, that is the United States attention was diverted for over a decade by the international war on terror. And then it was licking its economic wounds uh, after the deleterious uh, global economic and financial crisis. And so was uh, a large part of Europe. And so that lost opening decade of this century, uh, in my view, is responsible for the subsequent disequilibrium that was created in Asia. Uh, in a sense, the US emphasis on the Indo-Pacific is a kind of pivot uh, the re-emphasis that the United States has placed is a kind of pivot, uh, with multiple partnerships uh, being rejuvenated throughout the Indo-Pacific. 
Meanwhile, in the vacuum of that decade, the Chinese executed their own pivot, emerging unscathed from the economic crises that had bedeviled the rest of the world and confident just when the Western economies had taken a beating. So in my view, the Quad is really an offshoot of the Indo-Pacific, but it is still distinct in many ways. The Chinese see it for what it is. They regard it as an emerging grouping of countries, uh, a clique, as I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, and that these are countries, uh, all of whom have uneasy relations with China and which together can pose a potential threat or at least thwart China's spectrum of freedom of choices. The Quad has been derided by China, as you all know, for being an Asian NATO. Uh, but what is unique about the Quad? Let's go over that. Several things. Firstly, the Quad is a well-defined grouping of four countries, unlike the broader, more diffused concept of the Indo-Pacific. Neither of them have a geography, except that the Quad, because it comprises four countries, has a certain quasi-geography to it, but it still straddles both the oceans. Secondly, the Quad's main focus is on currently on developing a habit of cooperation along many planks as a response to what is broadly deemed to be a common concern about China's rise, its economic and economic, uh, its military and economic influence, which is growing by the day. The discourse on China as a security concern, in my view, is therefore the binding glue. But having said that, I must add quickly that it is couched also in references to rule of law, freedom of navigation, broader principles uh, like apple pie and mother's milk, which cannot be refuted by anyone, peaceful resolution of disputes, democratic values, and uh, territorial integrity. Even the working group set up at the uh, recently held summit meeting, especially on healthcare, uh, development of vaccines, uh, and uh, say on critical and emerging technologies, um, these are a response to what, what is seen as China's usurpation, if I might use that term, of uh, critical supply chains. Thirdly, regardless of China's criticism of the Quad, it is nevertheless gradually acquiring momentum. Uh, and this cannot be simply wished away by China or criticized into oblivion by China. In a span of less than two years, the Quad has been elevated from a uh, mid-level, official level dialogue, right all the way up to the summit level. The Quad cannot be easily expanded. There is talk of expanding it all the time, but it cannot be easily expanded, nor is it necessary in my view to do so. The core of the Quad is likely to remain the four countries, that is US, Japan, India, and Australia. It is seeking to engage others in a Quad Plus format. And we have seen that it has engaged Brazil, Israel, New Zealand, South Korea, and Vietnam, and more recently France as well, in terms of uh, maritime exercises. The Quad dialogue is now fully complemented, that is the other side of the coin, by a naval exercise in the form of the Malabar, which uh, has included Japan as a permanent invitee since 2015, um, from my time as ambassador in Japan, and also as a regular participant uh, since then. And Australia too has been invited and joined the Malabar exercise in 2020 and presumably will remain uh, an invitee in the future as well. And all these countries have cross-servicing agreements uh, among themselves, logistics uh, exchange agreements. Uh, members of the Quad are also carrying out naval exercises with others in various you know, permutations and combinations, including uh, within that scope, Vietnam and the Philippines, and as I said, more recently, uh, France. Uh, the Quad members, you're all aware, uh, recently exercised with France in the Bay of Bengal before India engaged France in a bilateral exercise in the Arabian Sea. Now, the great powers, uh, are they external, re extra re extra territorial, extra regional powers? Uh, or are they very much a part of this region? Uh, let me cover here some of the others, other than the United States, uh, which we know has several alliance partnerships and is intrinsically a part of the region uh, on every count for the last 70 years. But let's look at the others. France, Britain, Germany, 
the Netherlands and the EU, like the Quad countries and ASEAN, have developed their own Indo-Pacific outlook and vision statements. France is a very potent power. It has territories in both the oceans and military deployment as well. The France has about 7,000 military personnel uh, in both the oceans uh, in terms of uh, stationing at its various uh, uh, you know, colonies and territories. Um, Britain also has seven military bases uh, between the two oceans. Unlike Britain, which works, uh, in my view, uh, more in tandem with the United States, France occasionally tends to plow an independent furrow. Um, India did very well, in my view, to engage France, uh, not just uh, uh, in the context of the Quad, in waters uh, proximate to India, but also bilaterally. After all, I believe that there is much that India and France can do together, with or without the Quad, in terms of their common concerns uh, in, uh, in, 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 marit in protecting maritime uh, theatres, maritime security, and also countering terrorism in the region. Uh, including in Africa. After all, France has a very big footprint in uh, Africa as well. Uh, Germany, the Netherlands and the EU have all pegged their Indo-Pacific vision statements on ensuring stability for sustaining their economic and commercial interests in the region. So largely, uh, these countries that I just mentioned have also kind of looked at their commercial interests, their economic interests more than anything else. Uh, and especially. Uh, some of them want to also preserve their economic interests with China. But after Brexit, Britain is showing, showing um, uh, a newfound keenness to return to greater engagement uh, with Asia, a region with which it has great familiarity as a former colonial power. It is also demonstrating a willingness to recommit its potent naval power to the Indo-Pacific, uh, as evident in the planned dispatch of the Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier to Japan later this year. So broadly, there is general consensus among the Quad countries that the Quad is best kept distinct from the more inclusive, uh, the more um, inchoate Indo-Pacific. Uh, the Quad is likely to focus more on security issues, um, at least in the uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, discussions that are held, not necessarily public uh, uh, discourses. But it will always have an exoskeleton of uh, developmental and capacity building, uh, you know, sort of docking points uh, for others to plug in uh, into the quad plus format. So an exoskeleton uh, which permits uh, interface with other like minded countries on broader themes, on themes that are more acceptable, which can actually provide the basis for a broader consensus, leaving the quad to determine its own core with regard to uh, primary issues, security issues uh, in this theater. To my mind, the Indo-Pacific is a vision. It is not limited in scope by either a structure or any crystallized geography. Um, and I think this is a rather plus point for the Indo-Pacific. India's view of the Indo-Pacific as an inclusive concept, first articulated by the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Modi, at the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore in 2018, you might recall. Now that has been given fresh momentum by his subsequent elaboration of the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, OPOI, as we call it, at the East Asia Summit in Bangkok in 2019. The, uh, the IPOI, beg your pardon, has seven pillars of cooperation such as trade connectivity, maritime transport, maritime security, maritime ecology, uh, maritime resources, disaster risk reduction and management, science and technology development, academic partnerships, and so on and so forth. And several countries have not only joined one or more of these pillars, but also taken the initiative as a lead player. But when we look around for an overarching security architecture in the Indo-Pacific, uh, uh, we must ask this question, is there such an architecture? Does there exist, does, does, uh, 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 you know, does there emerge any such architecture? And the truth is that there is none at present. The East Asia Summit is the only existing dialogue platform, in my view, which covers geography uh, and issues that closely approximate, uh, closely resemble 
the coverage associated with the Indo-Pacific. The East Asia Summit includes the ASEAN, uh, which in any case are acknowledged by one and all to be uh, you know, the central core, as in ASEAN centrality uh, of the Indo-Pacific. But its advantage lies in that it also included all the Quad countries plus New Zealand and the Republic of Korea, as well as the two outliers, that is China and Russia. So effectively speaking, the East Asia Summit has 18 participants, including uh, China and Russia that actually oppose the Indo-Pacific and the Quad. India has been advocating the use of the East Asia Forum to promote its own version of inclusive cooperation in the Indo-Pacific through these uh, seven verticals that I mentioned. And it has itself taken the lead in two areas, uh, as far as I know, maritime security and uh, disaster risk uh, uh, reduction, if I'm not mistaken. Um, now, uh, China and Russia, in my view, will not permit any East Asia summit outcome document to legitimize the term Indo-Pacific. So in a sense, uh, trying to morph the East Asia summit to become uh, you know, a structure to promote the Indo-Pacific is, uh, uh, to my mind, a non-starter. Uh, but I thought I should juxtapose these two so that this frame of reference is available to you. The Quad leaders joint uh, statement titled The Spirit of the Quad, you might recall, not only speaks of ASEAN centrality, but also its unity. Now, this is in recognition of the fact that ASEAN, that is to say reference to unity, is in recognition of the fact that ASEAN is hopelessly fractured with the CLM countries, that is Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and perhaps some might say Thailand too, in the Chinese fold, within the Chinese fold, increasingly so as vulnerable dependencies. There is also a reference to uh, democratic values uh, you know, in that uh, summit statement, which may be important, especially to the uh, Democrats in the White House. But to my mind, it doesn't help uh, with potential partners in the Indo-Pacific, such as Vietnam, whose political and economic system is more similar to uh, that of China uh, uh, or that of the Philippines, uh, and that they cannot truly be held to the benchmark of uh, you know, possessing these democratic values. So does that then automatically rule them out? Does it limit the scope of their involvement? These are questions that I would readily ask. Um, in my view, as such, even ASEAN centrality is a double-edged sword, given China's growing influence over the group. Now, China would see advantage, in my view, uh, uh, for it is the only one involved in negotiating the code of conduct. It's an elusive code of conduct that has taken the last 20 odd years since 2002 uh, to you know, to, to even bring to the stage. And uh, there is very little likelihood that it can be completed uh, in terms of negotiations by 2022, which was some kind of a date that had been set. And since China is the only big power involved in the code of conduct, and since the code of conduct and whatever comes out of it is going to affect the rest of us, uh, one can say that China has the advantage in regard to this so-called ASEAN centrality. Now, as I mentioned before, for China, the Indo-Pacific and the Quad represent uh, Cold War mentality and cliques. And I'm going to end on this kind of a note here. Um, uh, I'll simply try to bring out a, a few more nuances, maybe in another two minutes or so. China remains greatly suspicious of both the Indo-Pacific and the Quad. This is what I started out with. The Asia-Pacific frame of reference is what keeps China front and center. And so China would like to continue to use the word Asia-Pacific, which, as I explained to you in, in quite some detail, is an archaic term now, no longer representative of contemporary reality. China, therefore, regards the Indo-Pacific as a framework which reduces its salience, hence the opposition. China maintains that regional groupings should be inclusive and should contribute to stability in the region. And it hints at the Quad not being uh, a grouping that falls in this category that is conducive to peace and stability. But it does not question the numerous other plurilateral structures, whether bilateral, trilateral, or quadrilateral, in which China itself is engaged in multiple ways. 
um so there is a dichotomy here in china's own position however china no longer regards the indo pacific as ocean foam that will soon dissipate uh, as uh, foreign minister wang yi had once put it china is increasingly wary of the quad and this anxiety is only set to grow why you might ask and i think the answer lies in the fact that contrary to expectations uh, that china and the united states will have possibly better relations uh, when a new uh, you know administration comes in um, these hopes have been belied the recent talks between the biden administration and china in uh, uh, anchorage in alaska went off rather badly uh but this was in my view entirely expected given that president biden and his team have accepted in some measure the trump legacy uh on these issues at least and they equally regard china as a strategic adversary so the die is cast there president biden has said so he has said that the united states is determined to maintain a strong military presence in the indo pacific to prevent conflict not to generate conflict but to prevent conflict his call for a thorough investigation into the origins of the corona virus though unrelated to the quad is no doubt going to fuel greater suspicion on china's part as to the objectives of the united states of america china may have uh, hoped for better relations but looking to the speed with which relations with the united states have fallen into the same adversarial groove uh, as they existed during the trump administration i would say that the scenario is not very optimistic but let me add uh, a word of caution here for india to take vicarious solace from the lack of trust in us china relations would be self limiting uh, in a way while the quad may help india obtain better intelligence and even military technologies uh, by building better uh, you know confidence uh, with these fellow Uh, partners in the quad perhaps even get moral support for our narratives on several issues uh, india will still have to deal with challenges on its land borders on its own there is no one who is going to come and do that heavy lifting for us as we deal with our primary challenges and that relates to our continental uh, you know borders india will have to also focus primarily uh, on its own region Uh, including in the maritime theater of the indian ocean uh, why so uh, particularly because uh, limited resources uh, will have to be taken into account and also the fact that india has relatively limited stakes in the south china sea and the pacific ocean as uh, compared to its stakes in the indian ocean so it's a relative comparison that i'm making and so therefore these factors will also shape india's role uh and uh, outlook uh towards the future within the quad the other great factor and on this note i will truly end here is china's own behavior now china's behavior uh its uh, aggressive uh, you know behavior its uh, militarization its uh, you know bullying tactics etc now all these as they uh, you know telescope into the future uh and acquire uh even greater uh, proportion uh and agency you know these definitely uh, have the potential to flip the quad uh, over into more overt uh, military cooperation in the future so in a sense therefore uh it is china that is going to determine to my mind uh, the future of the quad uh with these words i would like to stop here and uh, i have taken all of 39 minutes i was told i could go up to 40 uh, but i have stopped uh, break just in time uh, so that there are uh, uh, you know say 20 minutes or so uh, for interaction i'm grateful to you all for having listened to me uh, with such great patience but i thought i should share my views with you uh, with regard to both the quad and more particularly the broader frame of the indo pacific thank you thank you very much uh, thank you very much uh, ambassador shujanar chinoy uh, for your lecture on indo pacific and the quad opportunities and challenges uh, i want to personally thank you for your uh, lecture and uh, i think it's a pleasure to have you on our platform and also the detailed uh, treatment of the subject on indo pacific 
and the port which is very important in these uh, present uh, geopolitical environment. Uh, let me just uh, take some questions. So I think uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Nisha Acharya, uh, research intern at uh, the Foundation. I think uh, she would like to ask you some questions. Over to you, then. Good evening, sir. Uh, I just had this question that can the Quad as such be used as a potential platform by India uh, to push in for greater reforms in the United Nations? My short answer is no, because, uh, uh, you know, UN reforms uh, is a very complex matter that involves uh, uh, more than 190 countries. Uh, a very different kind of consensus has to be developed there. Uh, it involves uh, a very large number of uh, countries that uh, have absolutely no interest in the Indo-Pacific or the Quad. Uh, and uh, therefore, the short answer is no. Uh, in any case, UN reforms cannot be carried out, at least the more relevant ones uh, from our point of view, including reform uh, and expansion of the UN Security Council, uh, these cannot be carried out unless a sui generis uh, consensus is developed uh, among the permanent members of the UN Security Council. Uh, and you are aware of the fact that, you know, the Quad uh, does not include, uh, uh, you know, uh, Britain, though you might argue that Britain being uh, used to working in tandem with the United States will take its uh, cues from the US. But uh, certainly you are aware of the fact that uh, neither China nor uh, Russia, Russia, for that matter, France, uh, are part of the Quad. So short answer is no. Dr. Awad. Yes, uh, Ambassador, there are certain issues I would like to highlight because a couple of questions we had. But taking the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in the region and the Chinese encroachment into neighboring country of India, do you see the Quad is a necessity now to counter or balance the the uh, power in Asia, including India, that also a security concern? Look, you mentioned uh, the pandemic. So therefore, I uh, would assume that you are also referring to the opportunities and challenges in that context. Now, uh, you know, India and China are among uh, the countries that are known to be large uh, producers of uh, uh, you know vaccines uh, and uh, uh, it's true that China has also reached out to a number of countries including in South Asia uh, in terms of what you might call its uh, vaccine diplomacy. Uh, I think the primary focus of the global community today is on protecting human lives everywhere uh, and therefore I do not think we should diminish the importance of saving human lives regardless of whose vaccine is being used. Uh, but uh, I should say that the Quad is certainly looking at broader issues such as uh, uh, the integrity of supply chains. Uh, and this is uh, a discourse that began before the pandemic struck. I think it's a discourse that began in light of the broader uh, challenge that was already being faced in the context of the US-China trade war that we had seen for a couple of years uh, under President Trump, even before the pandemic struck. And in that context too, uh, you know, there was a certain uh, sort of realization on the part of many a country that over dependence on any one country uh, is not desirable. Putting all your eggs in one basket is not a very uh, sort of uh, advisable way to go forward. And this has only got compounded as a result of the pandemic in phase one of the pandemic, I would say, uh, there was a realization that everybody had to turn to just one country for even simple things like, uh, you know, PPEs and masks and things like that. And uh, later in phase two, uh, when China has relatively recovered from the pandemic and the others are still in the process of uh, kickstarting their economies and some are still reeling uh, under the impact of uh, the second wave, uh, there is a growing realization that even for kickstarting economies, the supply chains are still, uh, you know, relatively concentrated in China. Um, 
because everywhere else the economy shut down everywhere else the supply chains were disrupted but china had an early start so i think keeping all this in mind the general realization across the world uh, is not one of what you might call uh, you know uh, sort of disengagement from china but more uh, a, a development of a strategy of uh, risk mitigation uh, broadening your choices uh, ensuring that uh, supply chains are available without being linked to uh, any kind of political or strategic issue so in that context the quad as you know has been working on uh, uh, you know critical uh, technologies and uh, supply chains and uh, uh, these supply chains also include uh, the pandemic there is this idea of using us uh, uh, technology japanese funding uh, australian uh, you know marketing and logistics and indian uh, vaccine uh, production capability uh, to create uh, feasible uh, and acceptable alternatives and i don't think we should uh, uh, write off indian uh, vaccine uh, you know production capabilities though it's been in the news of late um uh, in view of the impact uh, the tremendous and 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 totally freaky uh, impact of uh, the second wave because india is uh, going to very quickly pull up its socks and uh, get back on to steam uh, and uh, you know retrieve a lot of the ground uh, that needs to be covered very quickly so uh, i i would broadly put it that way i i just need an additional question on this because uh, you are being diplomat in your answer i mean you are very still uh, running the career diplomat i need you from the strategic defense analysis you are running like chinese policy of recently become india centric after the himalayas crisis and even india see itself the security concern is so much so happening i just wanted to see do you see yourself because people saying that india is now in the american camps with the quad against china while china doing a low profile policy toward india in a different direction as a strategist how do you see this kind of you know a new scenario going to see between the two countries at the end of the day the, the asian century is led by both giants of asia how do you see that Uh, you raised a, a valid point but i think uh, that it is unfair to refer to india as being in anyone's camp india is too big a country uh, and and too big a population and um, uh, uh, you know uh, with with too powerful a history in anyone's camp uh, you know whether the us or 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 or, or anyone else uh, so we have to keep this in mind the the problem here is that it's not uh, india which looks at it this way but uh, there is a tendency on china's part to you know create a zero sum game here uh, with uh, third country considerations in mind now uh, this i think is a bit unfair on china's part because china is a country that has used um, uh, external balancing for a very long part of the existence of the people's republic of china uh, you may kindly recall that in 1950 soon after the founding of the people's republic of china china very quickly had a treaty with uh, the soviet union and it was a security treaty uh, and having said that uh, you know uh, they of course went into a decade of uh, fairly uneasy relations more to do with personality clashes more to do with uh, uh you know uh, leadership of the uh you know uh, international communist movement uh and uh, the ideological uh, clashes that uh, erupted uh, particularly uh, after uh, stalin uh, when khrushchev was uh, promoting a, uh, a a theory of uh, you know peaceful coexistence also with the united states and of course there was a complete break between the chinese and the soviet union uh, but uh, Uh, uh china also went on to further external balancing in 1971 72 when the great rapprochement with the united states was carried out rather successfully uh, brokered by uh, henry kissinger and uh, resulting in the visit of uh, of uh, president nixon in 1972 and china has used external balancing in south asia 
to the brim so to speak uh, in regard to its dealings with india so uh, if there is anything india centric it is uh, you know not from our viewpoint it's really the viewpoint that china has which is that you know if india comes closer to the united states it is uh, uh, definitely uh, detrimental to chinese interests and that's why i began by posing this big question that is it fair for a country that used external balancing for the last 70 years to be questioning the multi alignment strategy that india's strategic autonomy permits and had permitted in the past as well is it possible yeah. or feasible or justified for them to question this uh, so i i would leave it at that and i mean, don't forget that india had non alignment in the 1950s and yet it did not prevent india from uh, when the time came from reaching out to the us and uh, britain for some military assistance also in 1962 although that help uh, was limited and some of it came uh, a little too late uh, by then the you know uh, the 62 conflict had died down uh, and it did not prevent india from uh, you know signing and concluding a treaty uh, of uh, you know uh, friendship and cooperation with the soviet union uh, in uh, 1971 Uh, so and today too india has this uh, policy of multi alignment so our multi alignment is something that permits us to work with every conceivable partner on issues of mutual interest and we can do so while maintaining and preserving our strategic autonomy strategic autonomy offers india a spectrum of choices and i would say the chinese have done that uh, with great finesse over the last 70 years so we are in nobody's camp Uh, we are unlikely to be in anyone's camp, uh, and um, uh, you know one should keep that in mind. And uh, you've been a long time resident of uh, India; you know India well, and uh, I'm sure you will vouch for what I say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I go back to you, Soham. I'll come back to Ambassador. Please, Soham. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I think uh, you know, uh, Miss Achari, if you want to ask your short second question, then I'll pose another question. thank you sir uh, so i had this question how uh, in uh, you talked about fr uh, fr uh, france and how can india assure its autonomy even as it agrees to uh, get into greater alliances uh, uh, greater alliance with uh, relatively powerful nations like france i think uh, you have used an inappropriate term here because you're using a term which is potent with meaning uh you know uh, you use the term alliance now india has no alliance partnerships with any country and uh, the least of all with france uh, when you look at the scorecard uh, over the last few years you will find that uh, uh, we have ramped up our relations with japan we are cooperating for the first time in the defense field we have a logistics uh, uh, agreement uh, you know with them uh, uh, an axa uh, uh, you know agreement with japan we have uh, uh, maritime cooperation with uh, japan and more recently also exercises between the ground forces uh, with japan albeit at a small platoon level limited to uh, you know counter terrorism and counter insurgency kind of stuff in uh, warangte uh, uh, you know the school in mizoram the the jungle warfare school there uh, with australia we have also signed a uh, you know uh, Uh, logistics exchange uh, agreement and deepened our uh, cooperation along all fronts uh, you know all sorts of exercises and with the united states of america we have the largest number of exercises uh, that we conduct with any country that is to say the us is a very big player in terms of these bilateral exercises we've concluded some very relevant cooperative framework agreements as you are aware uh, beginning with uh, you know jisomia uh, uh, lemova uh you know uh, beka etc so i mean these uh, you know framework agreements have all been concluded uh, and we are a major non nato uh, ally uh, you know a very big defense partner uh, and in, in terms of the authorization we are under uh, you know tier 1 uh, 
um, industrial authorization, the industrial security uh, annex that was concluded during uh, Rajnath Singh's uh, uh, honorable minister's, uh, defense minister's visit to uh, the United States uh, uh, is something that permits the private sector also to participate wholeheartedly on, on both sides. So I don't see uh, what is it that we have done extra with France uh, that gives uh, you the uh, sort of uh, uh, impression that we are now engaging in an alliance with France. Uh, in, with France, uh, we have independent bilateral relations. France is a great partner for India. We have uh, a lot in common. We have cooperated so well. France has stood by India on a number of occasions, uh, including in the UN Security Council. And uh, for us to cooperate with them uh, on maritime security, counterterrorism is a very natural thing to do. Uh, so uh, certainly there is no autonomy at stake here. Uh, there is no erosion of India's autonomy of the type that you're hinting. Far from it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to ask you two quick questions. First is a uh, question we have received is, uh, can you slightly uh, in brief uh, elaborate on any uh, counterterrorism programs under Quad? Uh, I will not be able to go into details of, of uh, you know, the specifics, the granular part. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, the second is, you know, uh, Dr. Bina Singh Roy, our head for Western Central Asia Center, she wanted to be here, but you have a personal issue, cannot send her regards to you. And uh, she uh, was uh, talking about, you know, uh, since our uh, organization also has a lot of focus on Central and Russian affairs. So how do you look at the way Russians look at uh, the Indo-Pacific and this issue. I think it's more important for us to understand how we look at Russia. Okay. okay. And so let me begin by saying how I look at Russia. I look at Russia as a Pacific power, for it is a Pacific power. Uh, and it has long had, you know, a presence in the Pacific uh, Ocean. It has had a presence in the South China Sea. It was in Vietnam. It was at Kamran Bay. Uh, so Russia is not. Uh, an extra regional power to the Pacific. Uh, and for that matter, it is not uh, uh, alien to the Indo-Pacific at all. So I see Russia as a Pacific power. And I think it is useful to reassure Russia uh, that uh, the Indo-Pacific is, is not stacked up against uh, any country. Uh, it, it stands for several things, but it, is, is, it does not stand for being against somebody. Uh, and I think uh, uh, the Russians, uh, for that matter, even the Chinese did appreciate what Prime Minister Modi had said in Singapore uh, in his uh, uh, very uh, sort of uh, illuminating uh, remarks there about our vision of the Indo-Pacific. That particular uh, statement of the Prime Minister of India had been appreciated both in uh, Beijing and in Moscow. Uh, now, the point here is that we have a tendency to ignore the importance of Eurasia. Uh, you know, Eurasia may have many uh, countries that are either landlocked or twice landlocked, but which may also have a strategic outlook towards uh, the uh, Indian Ocean, uh, for instance. Uh, uh, and, and I think this part of it uh, should be respected. Uh, so my view is that Eurasia is uh, uh, an area that should also be uh, you know, increasingly consulted uh, with regard to the uh, vision of the Indo-Pacific. If we can consult Brazil uh, and Israel on the one flank, we can consult uh, the ROK uh, and New Zealand and others, Vietnam on the other flank. Uh, surely we can consult uh, other uh, potential stakeholders. And I think uh, during the Trump administration also, I recall when uh, Deputy National Security Advisor Matt Pottinger was here for the Ricina dialogue, uh, not, not the last one, which was virtual, but the one before that. He had spoken about, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the notion of Indo-Pacific stretching to uh, areas well beyond, uh, you know, the uh, west coast of India. So that earlier idea of it being limited in U.S. view to the west coast of India, it does not hold... Uh, uh, water here. Um, so I think uh, Russia is a very important player and should be reassured for us, particularly Russia is a very 
uh, important and traditional friend. Uh, we have very good relations with them and we continue to seek nothing but the best of relations with the Russian Federation. Uh, our arms dependency may have come down, uh, but that is simply because the arms offtake by India is also growing. The cake is getting much bigger uh, and we are also diversifying, keeping in mind uh, our own requirements uh, in terms of technologies, availability, compatibility, etc. So very much uh, in my view, uh, Russia should be considered a Pacific power and reassured so that there are no misgivings. Thank you so much. Uh, finally, I would like to, you know, ask you a bit about, you know, the Sri Lanka issue, you know, like you talked a lot about China. So how do you look at, you know, sort of uh, the investment of China under the Battle Road Initiative in various uh, Indian Ocean powers and the recent developments that have occurred? I personally think that nobody is against connectivity or infrastructure. Uh, you know, like the air, the sea, like space, uh, frankly, infrastructure and any form of connectivity is also a public good. Shall I put it that way? Simply put, once made, uh, you know, a bridge can be used by anyone. A road can be traversed on by anyone. So as such, nobody is against connectivity. Uh, connectivity is very important. And I think uh, particularly, particularly in Asia, there's been a dearth of uh, you know, resources available for the vastness of, uh, you know, the, the needs that need to be uh, met uh, in the next few years. People are talking about, uh, you know, uh, a trillion dollars worth of, uh, you know, uh, resources required to meet Asia's infrastructure, uh, you know, uh, needs. So this is something that, again, is unobjectionable. But the manner in which uh, infrastructure is carried out and more particularly if it is done through non-transparent means without offering a full spectrum of you know uh, open choices without uh, you know the long-term insidious uh, usurious uh, clauses uh, being uh, you know uh, brought up uh, up front and uh, made visible uh, you know this can result in relationships of uh, dependency and this is, I think, uh, something that a, a very large number of countries would object to, where the receiving country, the host country, finds that it is unable to repay loans uh, uh, because of insidious and usurious, uh, you know, terms that have been, uh, you know, embedded in such agreements. And this results in any kind of erosion of sovereignty. Then I think such connectivity and such infrastructure projects are bad. Uh, they are not recommended. Uh, also, that uh, infrastructure projects should be carried out based on the priorities of the host country, not, not on the priorities of a lending country. So, uh, effectively, even uh, uh, we have seen that there is some uh, criticism coming out of Pakistan itself uh, about the priorities uh, in the China-Pakistan economic corridor, which is a part of the BRI. So uh, I, I don't think we should judge uh, a book by its cover, uh, by the ease with which money is pouring in, uh, which is what I think uh, some might say Sri Lanka did, and then found itself unable to pay or repay the debt. And then it goes into hawk. And then it has to you know, uh, shift the uh, trade off in other areas, uh, you know, whether it's in terms of a port or whether it's in terms of the airspace above. Uh, you end up losing your freedom of choice. Dr. Abba, do you want to make a point? Please unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself. Ambassador, I just have a, yes, I actually I just have a question here. You spoke of uh, Russia and you spoke of China. Do you see India is, um, uh, how does India assist the China-US rivalry, especially in the trades and in the Asia-Pacific maritime security and freedom of, of uh, mailing or sailing in the maritime, in the asia could you, could you please repeat your question? Yeah, what he meant was that about what the China. Is, uh, yeah. India as, yeah, what is India assessment of the US-China rivalry and its impact on the security in Asia Pacific, especially when U.S. talks about the freedom of uh, navigation. Well, I can only speak on behalf of myself, not on behalf of India. Uh, 
because there are a number of opinions in India. I'm talking in terms uh, of the Quad. Yes. So my own view I can share with you uh, that, uh, and I th thought I had covered yeah. a large part of that in my presentation, that uh, in my view, uh, you know, China regards the U.S. as limiting its, uh, uh, you know, choices uh, uh, in terms of its newfound economic and military power. Uh, and China seeks uh, to uh, limit the extent to which the United States can exercise its power, uh, especially on China's periphery and on issues that are uh, considered core issues by China. And China would like to see the back of the United States of America in terms of its presence in the uh, broad theater uh, of uh, Asia or the Indo-Pacific or more particularly, uh, you know, the South China Sea uh, and uh, the Pacific. Uh, and this is not going to happen for the simple reason that uh, it's not just that the United States continues to be a very potent power, but that it has a long history of having been uh, as much part of this region as anybody else over the last 70 years in terms of its humongous trade flows, its investment flows, and its varied uh, you know, alliance, partnerships and treaties, physical presence, etc. So it's a pipe dream to imagine that uh, because you don't like a country that you can suggest that they should leave and that they will simply leave. Uh, in fact, a very large number of countries consider the US presence in this part of the world as a stabilizing force. And the retreat of the United States would be seen by many as a force that uh, upon retreat, you know, leaves behind in its wake a trail of disequilibrium. Uh, so therefore, uh, I think as I see it into the future, uh, with the action, economic, military, etc., having shifted uh, towards the Indo-Pacific uh, in more ways than was uh, the case in the past, we will see greater friction in years to come. Uh, and at this stage, neither side seems to be backing down and um, there are a few clear-cut hotspots that have already emerged. We can see how friction uh, uh, is felt uh, in the Taiwan Strait where the United States continues to uh, task its warships to sail down the Taiwan Strait in a demonstration of its you know right to freedom of navigation, overflight etc. Uh, we have seen that uh, it conducts these uh, freedom of navigation operations, does not accept the artificial baselines and uh, extended EEZ that the Chinese claim after having uh, made uh, rocky outcrops into so-called islands and then, uh, you know, stretching claims with regard to the EEZ. Uh, the US does not accept the absolute baselines that uh, China seeks to claim for islands in the South China Sea, which are not entitled to archipelagic baselines uh, and uh, therefore the US does not accept the uh, you know notion of the South China Sea uh, evolving into some kind of a sovereign Chinese lake where everybody must you know seek permission to enter and inform the, Ch the Chinese in advance nobody really accepts that so this is bound to result in uh, some kind of contestation uh, and to add to that, we will have uh, the economic tensions also continue. Uh, so I, I think that the, the situation will be more complex and fraught as, uh, as the decade uh, evolves. Uh, and uh, I think it really calls for much greater consultations uh, and uh, uh, much greater effort to see what kind of an overarching security architecture can be put in place to prevent conflict. Nobody really wants conflict. Conflict is not in the interest of this part of the world. It has many pending, uh, you know, intractable issues uh, and disputes, uh, despite the fact that civilizationally there is so much in common in this part of Asia. Uh, and in terms of economic progress, uh, this part of the world has uh, you know, Asia, home to 60% of the global population, has actually done well for itself. Not just China, not just Japan, but even others like the Philippines, Indonesia, India, uh, Bangladesh, uh, more particularly before the pandemic struck, 
have been doing well for themselves. Uh, but is there a matching security architecture available to us? Uh, is it available in certain parts? Is it something that can be stretched to the rest of uh, this region? These are all moot questions. And for the foreseeable future, I think there will be greater contestation in the Indo-Pacific over these concepts of even freedom of navigation over flight. Uh, because UNCLOS is also interpreted differently by different people. Uh, the you know right of innocent passage is there uh, for warships, not for commercial interests um, in territorial waters. Um, and the United States uh, uh, enforces that right in terms of international law. Um, the Chinese have different uh, you know views uh, despite being uh, you know party to UNCLOS. So. To my mind, there will be greater contestation uh, and uh, nobody is about to uh, go away. In fact, you will have greater uh, concentration of, of other powers also coming in. The Russians, for instance, have seen new interest in joining certain exercises in the South China Sea with the Chinese. In the Indian Ocean, they have engaged in exercises about a year ago with uh, uh, you know, Iran uh, and uh, uh, Russia. Russia, China, Iran have exercised in the Indian Ocean. Russia, um, China and uh, South Africa have exercised together in a trilateral. We will see more of this happening. And especially with the UK coming back, with France coming back, there will be more of uh, a churn in this region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think uh, we have uh, come to the end of this session and I thank everyone for being a part of this special lecture on Indo-Pacific Indo and the Quad Opportunities and Challenges by Ambassador Shujanar Chinoy, Director General MPIDSA and former Indian Ambassador to Japan, organized by Turatuma Foundation. I thank uh, Ambassador Chinoy for his presence and we hope to uh, you know, have further collaborations with the Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis in areas of common interests. And I also thank uh, Dr. Wai Lawad, Distinguished Advisor West Asia, Turatuma Foundation and uh, Ms. Tanisha Acharya, Research Engineer at the Foundation. Thank you so much.